It was good to be in church. I was preaching one time at a church in Virginia Beach outside of Norfolk, and it's a Navy church. And a lot of Navy uh, sailors were in the church, and it was dead as a hammer. Dry as last year's corn shucks. If a, if a cow walked in, he'd give milkshakes before he got to the altar. And so while I was preaching, I couldn't get a grunt out of them. They wouldn't say nothing. I'd like this board after them. First time I ever preached there, didn't really know nobody. Didn't really know the pastor. He had heard me in the meeting, asked me to come preach for him on a Sunday. And I told him while I was preaching, I said, listen, in a couple of weeks, I'm preaching at Fort Bragg. I'll be preaching in the church. It's got a lot of the 82nd Airborne. And I said, when I preach there, they go, hua, while you're preaching. They don't say, man, they go, hua. And I said, if you can't preach there, you're probably not even saved. I said, they get with you. And I said, if you bunch of squids and rust pickers don't start saying amen, I'm going to tell them y'all can't take preaching. <laughs> that church went Pentecostal just like that. <laughs> the pastor sat on the front pew, put his head down, was shaking his head going, oh, no. He turned my church into an old-fashioned, screaming, hollering amen in Baptist yeah. church. And uh, when I was getting to leave, he said, you know, you're kind of out Kind of crazy, ain't you? I said, no, not really. I said, if I had my medication, I'm okay. But, uh, we kind of laughed a little bit. He said, I like you come back preach a meeting. So, hallelujah. Yeah. So if y'all don't amen, amen me every now and again, like every other word I say, I'm going to go back home and tell the southern folk, western folk can't take it. So, uh, yeah. amen. Go. No, you know I wouldn't do that. My people can't take it, and they're from the south. So, uh, We're in uh, the book of Deuteronomy tonight, chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Somebody was talking about the other day here in town. I don't know where we was at. Was talking about getting jumping in the water, jumping in the river or something. And they said, well, you, you sound like you're from down south. I said, I am. I said, down south Georgia. They said, do you ever go swim in the water down there? I said, no, no, uh -uh, no. No, I was uh, at one of my church members' pond one time. He's got 150 acres of land, beautiful, beautiful country. It's all swamp, most of swamp land, a lot of ponds and stuff. Uh, those um, um, cypress trees with the Spanish moss hanging oh, down. Man. To tell you how far south I am, I'm probably four hours farther south than Duck Dynasty. <laughs> They're Yankees compared to where yeah. we're from. <laughs> and so, um, but I was, on, I was at my, one of my church members' house fishing. And uh, Aaron was with me, Isaac was with me, my wife was with me. And uh, we, me and Isaac was in a boat, a little John boat, paddling around, the breeze was blowing us around, cypress trees in the lake with the Spanish moss. And I learned that day that wasps like to build their nests right behind the moss. That Spanish moss that just swings in the breeze. Isaac's with me, we're going along, we're fishing. Right before we hit one of those wasp nests, Literally face high to Isaac. He was on the other side of the boat. I'm on one side. I said, Isaac, you're about to get stung. Get ready. It was right at his face. He was, he was had his back to it. And we were getting near. We were drifting. The wind was blowing, and the moss had got blown where I could see him. I didn't see him before. I said, son, get ready, and he'll tell you. He turned around, and there was a wasp nest. That big around covered and I took the boat oar, and right before I did it, every wash, their wing went like this. All the wings spread. I said, oh, it's about to be on. <laughs> so I touched the boat oar as high up above the tree as I could above them and started to push off. Well, again, it shook the tree. And we commenced to having a good time. The wasp started to come out. We started throwing stuff. He had the glasses on, threw them out into the water, <laughs> threw the boat oar. We couldn't get away from the tree because now they're going, I'm, we're throwing stuff, trying to get away from They're tearing our lunch up. Eventually, we get away paddling with our hands, getting away from the water. Now, this pond, we finally get away. We paddle over with our hands to get the boat oar. We paddle back to the dock. My wife, Aaron's over at the dock. And we get over there, and we pull the boat out of the water. We're, we roll it over to dump the water. I said, Isaac, want to go with me to go back to the boat laying table? He said, oh, no. I get back to the boat with you, Daddy. We got hit. We had bumps swole up. And so I tried, almost got my wife in the boat, but she can't swim and she don't trust me. So she wouldn't get in the boat. So I paddle back across this big old pond, heading to the other side of the boat land. I'm going to leave it there. Halfway across, alligator pops up. Big old alligator. Isaac could verify this. He was there. 
And I'm in the boat by myself. I'm heading to the other side. The alligator pops up. He's about, he's about from me to the preacher. I could reach out and touch him. He come up, looked at me. I yelled back to the dock to my wife. I said, alligator. They all look. There's this alligator come to the surface watching me. I'm watching him. I'm in the boat. Thanking God I'm in it. About that time, the breeze blows me into another tree. Apparently, there was a subdivision of wasp nest because there was another one on the other tree. I'm not lying, am I? It blew me into another tree. The wind was blowing that day. I hit another wasp nest. Now, this time, I'm by myself. It's right before I hit it, I saw the wings go out. Alligator's still here. I hit it. The wasp go crazy. I instinctively roll the boat to get away from being stunned. I go in the water and my first thought is, oh, thank the Lord, I'm under the water with an alligator. No, that's not what I thought. I'm not going to tell you what I thought. I thought, oh, dear God, I'm in the water with an alligator. I roll the boat back over trying to get out of the water. I'm hollering, screaming. They're at the dock watching this and they think I'm fighting an alligator. <laughs> Wife's over yonder. She's debating about whether she's going to remarry or not. Aaron, he's over there fishing. He don't really care. What were you doing, Isaac? You don't even remember. He's probably all praying somewhere. And so I finally got back in the boat. Water filled the boat up. I had like one inch of boat sticking out of the water all the way around. I had to get straddle my knees to get back to the dock. And so that, that's, that's one of my stories. You just don't get in the water down South Georgia. <laughs> And uh, there's places. It's just worth it if you caught some fish. <laughs> no, I didn't catch some fish. <laughs> but uh, uh, my church member, he, he is one of these, he's one of these fellows that you meet him, you go, wow. Not a big fellow, but they're fearless when it comes to stuff like this. He actually has trained them to come to him. What? He will actually step over the dock. And I said, he's, we've seen him do it. He'll say, George. He'll yell out, George. And he's named them. And you'll see the eyes pop up and he'll start sloshing the water around and the alligator will come to him and he will feed him marshmallows and things like that. So uh, that's some of my church folk. Hallelujah. So you better believe I stay straight. Believe me, if I get in trouble, they're going to get rid of me. And I'm telling you down there, if they get rid of you, the last thing they're going to hear from you is a burp from an alligator. They'll never see you again. We got ways of disposing of folk down there. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse number 5. If you wouldn't be able to like for you stand your feet and reverence the word of God. Again, thank you for uh, inviting us to come, preach. Uh, we've had a good time today. My eyes get myself went down Canyon Road. He was just a boy when we was here last, so he don't remember a lot of it, just the vague memories. And uh, so I'm, uh, we're having a good time getting to look around. Amen. And uh, just that's just a beautiful road. I'm telling you, I've been all over the country, and I've sat in my pulpit back home. Did I believe Canyon Road outside of Ellensburg, Ellensburg, Yakima is probably the prettiest roads in the country just to ride down. And yeah, just beautiful. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse number 5. <clears throat> and I've led you 40 years in the wilderness. <clears throat> Your clothes are not waxing old upon you. And thy shoe is not waxing old upon thy foot. My Jesus, help us to help you people. Use us, I pray, to bring glory and honor in your name. Increase our faith. Touch and help the hearts of you people. I know some are in battles. I pray, God, you give them strength and encouragement tonight that that one that may be in the great battle, I pray, God, you give them peace in their soul. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for all that that you've done for us. Now bless us tonight. Help us tonight to be a help to your people. And we'll thank you tonight, and we'll thank you at the judgment seat for us in Christ, and we pray. Amen. 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 You be seated. Thank you for standing. In uh, Deuteronomy Chapter 29, you know this, uh, many of you have been in church for a long, long time, saying tonight that the shoes that they wore in the wilderness lasted for 40 years is not going to be news to you. You've heard that, you know that. That God put a pair of shoes on them that they wore every single day of their life for 40 straight years. And the shoes they wore never went, never wore out, never went out of style. That is a miracle. Yeah. Now, we know that God parting the Red Sea was a miracle. Yeah. We know God infesting the land with flies was a miracle. Right. We know that God, uh, the blood being put on the doorposts and God uh, sparing the lives of all the Jews that put blood on the doorposts was a miracle. Right. 
We know that God turning all the dust on the ground and lice was a miracle. That God turning all the water and the blood was a miracle. God infesting the land with frogs was a miracle. I've heard all those things, but this thing about the shoes never wearing out, that's never really been a major highlight of, of men saying this is proof there that God did a miracle. But the miracle of the shoes not wearing out is way up there with all the other ones that God did. It yeah. was a miracle. They wore those shoes all the time. They never wore out, not a single time. It's amazing that this happened. The wardrobe didn't even wear out, but specifically the shoes, if you would, never went out of style. No one because of the soles of the shoes. The soles that they, the shoes were made out of what they walked on, the soles were so good and so strong that it did not matter what environment they were in, it did not matter what terrain that they were walking on, the soles still held up. Forty years. They're not on walking paths, they're in the wilderness. They're stepping on all kinds of things that would tear the bottom of your shoes to pieces and for 40 years wandering around, they never lost the shoes. The soles never wore out. Not one single time. Because the soles, they were a miracle. Never went out of style because of soles. That never what they wore that, that day when they put their shoes on, never went out of style because of the support of the shoes. These shoes were good no matter where you were at. They were also good not only for where you was at in the environment, that was also good for no matter what stage of life you were in. Whether you were just a seven-year-old kid coming out of Egypt, or you were a 70-year-old grandmother coming out of, out of Egypt, whatever shoes you were wearing were going to last you till the day you died. Never went out of style. And they always had support. No matter what level of maturity a person was at, when he left Egypt, the shoes he had on always was going to work for him. And I'll explain more detail how that actually worked, being that no doubt they got bigger and they got, they got older and the knees began to change with the shoes, but they still worked for them nonetheless. Never went out of style. I'm preaching on the thought that on some things never go out of style. Some things never go out of style. The shoes never went out of style because of the soles and the support. It also never went out of style because of the size. The fact of the matter is the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter number 8, if you'll give me a second, I'll find the scripture reference. Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Bible talks about how uh, these, uh, what they were wearing, the size of the shoes were so perfect. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, listen to what it says. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply, go in and possess the land which the Lord God, which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God, uh, the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to improve, uh, to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did the, thy fathers know. That he might make thee know uh, that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that precedeth out of the mouth of the Lord uh, doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee. Listen to what it says. Neither did thy feet did thy foot swell these 40 years? What's that mean? It means the shoes fit. Amen. If the shoes didn't fit them right, it would have made blisters. The shoes would have been so uncomfortable they couldn't have worn them. They would have had to take them off. Go barefooted. God said, the shoes I put on your feet fit you so well, your feet never swole up. You never got blisters. No matter where you was at in life, no matter what stage in life you was at, the shoes fit, never wore out. They were also never going to go out of style because of the selection. What I mean by this is it was good for every generation. Now here's something interesting. In Numbers chapter 2 verse 32, a census was taken just as they go into the wilderness and the people were numbered how many Jews come out of Egypt and went into the wilderness. That's number 2. At the end of 40 years in Numbers chapter 26, another census was taken on how many Jews had made it through the 40 years of journey. And the difference in the number, after 40 years of time, even though there was almost a million Jews, the number only fluctuated by 2,000. In other words, every time somebody died, a baby was born. Every time somebody expired, here come a young one. Now you have to understand that for 40 years, 
The main job the priest knew how to do was bury folk. It took 80 funerals a day to bury enough people for them, that generation, to die off before it come time to cross in, into Canaan land. Yeah. All, the, all the priests knew how to do at that time, for the most part, was how to bury people. Yet at the same time, the midwives were birthing the youngins like crazy. Now watch this. That means a child, a little toddler, has come out of Egypt wearing shoes fit for a toddler. But he gets bigger. So now he wears somebody else's shoes that were maybe eight or nine years old. He got their shoes. They became teenagers. They got this teenager's shoes who's now become an adult. They're constantly switching these shoes around amongst all the people. And it never goes out of style. What worked for him, worked for him. What worked for her, worked for her. The shoes were being interchanged amongst the people. They didn't have to make a lot of new shoes because the numbers didn't change. They all wore the same shoes passed around as they got bigger to the next one. And when somebody passed away and died, they kept the shoes and then they were given to somebody else who was the same size as the one that had passed away. When something doesn't go out of style, it means that what works for you will work for them. My son's here tonight, one of, the th one of my sons. One of the things that's often time, and he was asked this the other day, it kind of threw him when he was asked the question, because it was a lingo he's not used to. Uh, one of the, the dear brethren asked him Sunday, said, what's your gift? Well, my son looked at him like a calf looking at a new gate. He didn't know what that meant. What do you mean, what's my gift? Daddy ain't got me nothing yet. But what he meant, what the brother was saying is, what is it that you can do for God? Which is a good question. Yeah. And once I looked at my son as a son, what he means is, what is it you're doing for God? And I said, me, so I played the mandolin at the church. And we have a group in the church, we call them the psalmist. We invested in our young people years ago. And what I did was I had the adults in the church that would sponsor one of the young people. If a young person wanted to play an instrument, they got one of the families in the church to pay for the, the, uh, the, pay for the lessons. And I've got a preacher boy in the church that can play anything. So he would take every Sunday afternoon, they paid him $20 a lesson, someone in the church paid for a young person, and then the requirement was you couldn't let it be your parent. It had to be someone else in the church. And so all the adults were sponsoring a lot of young people to play instruments, and a lot of these young people had never played nothing. And then after a couple of years or so, we got a group, we call them the psalmist. I said, y'all psalmists come on. And they played together. Guitar, mandolin, banjo, violin, Piano, and every one of them, two or three years ago, couldn't play nothing. Wow. Especially Isaac, he couldn't play a radio. <laughs> Not a lick of talent. But now can play the mandolin. He's got other instruments he's trying to learn. He runs the sound system at church. My boys, are, they're active in the house of God. My oldest son is a Sunday school teacher in the church. My middle son, Aaron, he plays an acoustic bass guitar. So he's involved in it. Other young people in the church are involved in what we do with the seniors. We don't have a lot of young people, but the ones that are there are involved. Amen. And so we try to get them to understand that what has worked for me for over 30 some years in the ministry, and I'm 53 years old, I got saved in my youth. I've been saved a long time. And what worked in my life and my youth is what worked in their lives and their youth. Amen. And what oh, works for me now works for them now. Right. We don't have to change. No. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of change going on. The next generation trying to tell the older generation what worked for you don't work for us. I say in the Japanese terminology, hagiwashi, it does work. What worked for my grandparents is what worked for me. What works for me is what works for them. Amen. So, preacher, well, what worked for your grandparents? Prayer. Morningstar Baptist Church, Brother John and I, we're out of the same church. He went to Morningstar years ago before I went there. I never knew his pastor, Brother Hoffman. His pastor is my pastor's father-in-law. Wow. So my pastor's Ron Young, Brother Hoffman's son-in-law. So Brother John was under Brother Hoffman, I'm under Brother Young. But we have the same heritage out of the same church. Amen. Amen. And them old-timers go up out there in the woods up the Young Mountain and start praying for service starts. That's the heritage that we both have. That's how it used to be in days gone by, men gathered together to pray. Women gathered together to pray. 
and they sang the old hymns and they worshiped the God of heaven. But nowadays we're being told you've got to have this, you've got to have that, you've got to offer this, got to offer that. Well, I'm telling you, the same pair of shoes I wore years ago works for him today. Yeah. Right. Amen. We don't have to change. Some things just don't go out of style. Right, right. right. Because of the selection. No matter what generation needed it, what worked for the other one worked for them. Number five, the fifth reason never goes out of style is because of the, of the satisfaction. So preacher, what, how do you know? Do you think they were satisfied? I'm going to blow your mind with this one. You think you're intelligent? This is the best I've ever come up with. You ready for this one? You never one time see the Jews in the Old Testament complain about shoes. They never did. They complained about the food. They complained about the manna. They complained about everything else. They complained about Moses. They complained about Aaron. They complained about uh, everything they got, the quail that God sent them. They complained about everything. You will not find one record they complained about the shoes. Wow. Yeah. Now let me blow your mind. How many of you got in your closet? <laughs> You got more than one pair. Oh, yeah. And they wore the same pair every day for 40 years. Well, you ain't wearing the same shoes you were wearing last night either, preacher. Neither am I. I ain't wearing the same pair of shoes every single night. I've got several pairs of shoes. They're dress shoes. Then I've got work boots. Then I've got tennis shoes. Then I've got loafers. Then I've got bedroom shoes. One thing I don't have, sorry, I don't have flip-flops. I never have brought myself to that point. Y'all wear them all you want to. I just can't handle that flop, flop, flop on the back of my heel. We all got multiple pairs of shoes. We all got multiple pairs of shoes. How would you like to go 40 years and never buy another pair? These shoes were so good that never complained. They complained about everything else under the sun. You ain't going to go buy another pair of shoes already, <laughs> Brother Gay. They complain about everything else under the sun except the shoes. It means they were satisfied. They were completely content with the shoes that God had given them. The fact is we have different shoes for different needs, yet they themselves had one pair of shoes that worked for everything. You know what it means? They were a walking miracle. Amen. Every step they took was a miracle. Every single step, every single day of their life, they were a walking miracle. Now I'm going to look at these shoes quickly. Just three quick things I'm going to give you tonight and I'll be done. Three things about these shoes. I want you to know what they typify. The shoes never wearing out represent three basic things that never, ever go out of style. Number one, sinners being saved never goes out of style. There is nothing that encourages the church more than to watch somebody give their heart to Christ right. and then to watch that person's life begin to grow and yes. develop and to start pleasing and honoring God. I'm thankful when I hear the reports of Brother David about the number of tracts given out, the number of pieces of literature given, the number of people that's made professions of faith, that encourages me. So preacher, you think all of them are real? I don't know if half of mine's real. <laughs> it ain't for me to decide. Right. I think percentage-wise, that's a decent percentage. Yeah. That probably oh, yeah. sounds pretty close to what it would be. If I preached 5,000 messages and I had that many professions of faith, that'd be pretty much lined up right. I'm going to tell you, a lot of churches never see anybody saved anymore. Right. And a lot of times the life and the joy of that church wanes because of that. It gets weaker. It never gets out of style seeing somebody getting saved by the grace of God. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 11... Exodus chapter 12, verse number 11. This is the night of the Passover. God's telling them what He wants them to do. He says this in verse 11 of Exodus chapter 12. And thus shall you eat it, eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. The night of the Passover, before they had the Passover meal, they already put their shoes on. And these are the shoes they're going to wear the next 40 years. Every single time they go to bed at night, the last thing they take off their body is their shoes. 
And every night when they go to bed and they take their shoes off, they're reminded of the night they put them on when they was going through the Passover that night in Egypt. Every morning when they wake up, the first thing they think about when they're getting their clothes on, they turn their self off the side of the bed, they reach out and grab the shoes, put them on their feet. It's the same shoes they put on that night at Passover. Every single step they take as they're walking, every time they look down, they see their shoes. Those are the shoes they wore that night on Passover when they were delivered out of Egyptian bondage. Every step of their life, they are reminded of the night that God saved them out of bondage, out of Egypt, and as a reminder that it never, ever goes out of style. When you wake up in the morning, you're drawing the breath of life. God's been good to you because He saved you. When you go to bed at night and the last thought that enters your mind in the land of sobriety before you enter dreamland should be, thank God for the day I got saved. Every step of your life is a testimony to the day or the night that you gave your heart to Christ. Amen. It never goes out of style. We have a man in my church. And I'm, I'm, in, a very, I'm in a very precious area. It's like going back in time. The people there, it's like going back a hundred years. They're just... They're all farmers. They're all just common country people. Uh, racially, it's probably 50-50, but everybody gets along. There's no issues. We're all neighbors. We worship together. We go to school together. We eat together. We go through storms and trials together. It's just a precious, precious place to be in. But we also have some nuts. <laughs> we got this one guy started coming. His name, we call him Crazy Roger. When I said we all got nuts, half the crowd pointed at you. So I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that. Anyway. I'm just putting it on the right <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, this guy we called, called Crazy Roger. Crazy Roger was exactly what we called him. He's crazy. He'd come in church. He'd sit there and he'd always get mad at me. He'd come about once every six months, sit through half the service, get up and walk out and be mad, mumbling under his voice. Had wild hair, big old bushy beard. All you see was his beady eyes, nasty clothes, never bathed. He was just, he was crazy. He was crazy. He come by sometimes and said, Preacher, I was at the house. He said, I'm sitting on my front porch smoking a cigarette. And he said, This big bright light come over the house, hung over the pine trees. I said, Foom! Took off, went to Jerusalem. He said, Maybe went to Homerville. That's the next town over east. I said, maybe that, that bright light just went to Homerville. He said, no, I went to Jerusalem. I mean, the guy's crazy. He's crazy as he can be. And he would do stuff. And he, one time he'd come in church. This is the truth. Isaac's here. He'd verify everything I'm saying. One Sunday morning, we're in Sunday school. Sunday school's who we are. People are just now going to get up and start milling around, talking to each other. And all of a sudden, boom, Roger comes busting the vegetable doors. I mean, just boom, comes crashing and said, how many of y'all read Ezekiel? 38. And I walked up to him. I put my arm around him to calm him down and to calm them down. Let him know he was okay. I said, Roger, what would you read about it? He went off and just started talking about Ezekiel 38, Germany and Gomer and all this kind of stuff. And I said, that's good to know, Roger. I said, would go and take a seat, kind of calm down if you would a little bit. He's crazy. One Sunday, he got walked out mad He's walking out the door. He said, that judgment you preach, he said, that great rock throne judgment, he said, you're just saying that to scare people. Instead of going into an argument with him, I said, you're probably right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and it threw him off. He didn't know what to say in an argument. I said, you're probably right. Don't even worry about it. And he walked out. He didn't, you could see him moaning under his breath, walking off. He didn't know what to say. Some people looked at me like I was crazy. How come I responded that way? About a month or two goes by. Roger comes in again. Roger's acting weird. Er. So he comes in. I go to one of the men and said, y'all watch Roger. I don't know what he's up to, but he may see Jesus today. So y'all make sure I don't go see Jesus too is all I'm saying. He comes in and sits on the front pew. I'm up there preaching. And before I get done, he jumps out of the pew. I said, verify this. He comes rushing toward the pulpit. Well, I immediately go into a stance. I'm getting ready for him. I said, what do you want, Roger? And he just broke down so he said, I want to get saved. Oh, I can't take this no more. 
He gets on the altar. So Levi, Levi's Moses' son. So Levi, come here and help Roger. Levi goes down the altar and go off to one side. We have four sections in the church. Roger goes that way. Levi gets up and comes to Roger. Levi's got his Bible out. The problem with my son Levi is he thinks you have to be a theologian to be saved. And so Levi read two or three verses. The more Levi read, the more upset Roger got. Roger's bawling. So go in your head. And I said, Levi, let him pray. Roger prayed, get done. Levi weren't sure if he understood, so Levi read more verses. Roger break down again. This happened two or three times. I finally reached on the head. Levi I said, quit. You're killing the man. I said, you don't keep reading to him. And he finally got done praying. He got by Sir Roger, get help. He come up. He said, I got saved, preacher. I got saved today. Man, the whole church, we was all, we was, wow. Thank God. He didn't kill the preacher. That's all I was thinking. The next day, I'm here to leave, go to South Carolina, preach a revival meeting. He comes pulling up in the drive with his wife. He's still bawling. He comes up, his wife's bawling. She's a preacher. He's been crying all night. She said, I ain't never seen him like this. He comes up, he said, Preacher, you said you're trying to pay for that church van, get it paid off. There's a van you're wanting to buy for the church. I said, Yes, sir. So we got a little bit left over. He said, I just got my last insurance check. He'd been in the wreck years prior. He said, I just got my last check. I want the church hat. It was the exact amount we needed to pay off that church bus. So I called the pastor in South Carolina. We supposed to meet at a certain time. I said, Preacher, I love you and everything, but I'm going to be late. I've got to go to the bank. So I took the check, went to the bank. I didn't know if it was real or not. I go in the bank. I'm thinking, I hope it's real. Praise God. If it's not, if it's not, it's going to kill my story. So I go in there the bank. I see the lady. I said, ma'am, I said, I have a check from this guy. And I don't know if it's real or not. I just want to make sure. I said, if it's not real, don't say nothing to nobody. I'm not even going to tell him I know it. And we'll just let it go. Let him think he paid it off. I said, if it is real, praise God. So we go in her office. I hand her the check. She looks at it. She double takes. She looks at me. She said, he gave you this? I said, he got saved yesterday. She said, Roger? I said, yeah, Roger. Everybody in town knows him. She said, Roger, yeah. I said, Roger got saved yesterday. Made profession of faith. Gone to the altar. Wept his way to God. Come today. Give me this check to pay for the rest of the church band. She said, and she said it again. And started crying in the bank. Don't even go to my church. Just started bawling. You mean he got saved? I said, this guy made a profession is what I'm telling you. She said, well, I'm doing a check. I said, deposit it. I said, if it bounces, don't tell nobody. Amen. I said, we'll pay the penalty, but just don't tell nobody. It cleared. Oh, wow. Praise Amen. God. Amen. He started coming over to my leather shop. Three, four o'clock in the morning. If he sees my light on there walking, I can be in there working on leather stuff at four o'clock in the morning. And Roger come knocking on the door. The beard's gone. His hair's cut. Wow. The man had a stroke some years ago, and a lot of his craziness because of that stroke. He sat down, he'd tell me, Sir Preacher, tell me what I need to do. And it don't matter what I tell him, he'll do it. And I don't I don't do stuff mean to him. I just, Roger, you might need to do this. He started giving out so many door hangers. We literally ran out of door hangers. He got everyone, gave everybody all over town door hangers. Two times the law has tried to stop him. One time they pulled up and said, hey, Roger, you can't keep doing this. Roger told me, I didn't know what to say. I've been reading my Bible and I just happened to come across this verse. He said, all I want you to do is tell him what the verse said. He said, I looked at him and said, Jesus said, walk to obey God rather than man. Yeah. He said, everybody needs to come here. My preacher yes. preach. They, love, they need to come to my church. Yeah. They need Jesus. And I'm going to go out and just keep telling people, you know what you want to do. Amen. Cops said, well, be careful. <laughs> He's witness to the cops. There's been people I've been working on that I can't get. Roger's got to come to church. Oh he got a guy to come to church that's so introvert, can't even be around people. First two or three times he comes up, he would get walk out, be there two minutes. He gets so tore up. Got a lot of mental problems. Roger kept working. He kept coming. Kept coming. Finally, after about five services, he stayed through one whole service, proud of himself. Then he finally told Roger, he said, I can't hear nothing. Roger said, move up. <laughs> so now the man sits on the second in the front row. Nervous. Nervous as a cat in a round room full of rocking chairs. He's scared out of death of everything. He's sitting there. Amen. Roger got him coming. Amen. He's been bringing people to church. We got one guy came started. He came one time with a fishing pole sitting on the front row. I said, "You got to get that thing out of here." Half my crowd ain't gonna listen. Nothing I'm preaching. They're all gonna be thinking about fishing. 
That's the crowd Roger had been bringing with him. Amen. Amen. Ain't nothing encourages the church more than see somebody give their heart to Christ. Right. And to watch them put them shoes on. Yes. And start walking in that salvation God's given them. Sinners get saved never goes out of style. Number two, society being silenced never goes out of style. The Bible said that they wore this wardrobe and it never went out of style. Where did the wardrobe come from? Exodus 12, verse 35. The children of Israel did according to the word of, the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they lent them unto them such things as they required. They spoiled the Egyptians. The Bible said so they, that they lent unto them such things as they required. When the word says lent, we're not talking about something that has on Friday on occasion. We're talking about lending something. If I lend you something, what's the expectation? You're going to give it back. The Bible says another verse said they, they got things such as they would borrow. It used the term they would borrow. That meant they're going to bring it back. These bunch of Jewish people must have been Baptists. <laughs> because when they borrowed these clothes from these Egyptians, they never brought them back. The Bible said they spoiled the Egyptians. They took their silver, their gold, and their brand new raiment. And these, these Egyptians gave these Jewish believers, these Israelites, their clothes. Wow. And you see all these images of these, all these thousands of Israelites leaving Egypt wearing these tattered clothes, wore out and exhausted, just look terrible as they're leaving, just dragging their sleds as they're leaving Egypt. Horrible looking clothes. No, that ain't what they look like. If you get a mental image of what it looked like, it looked like Mr. T. Had all the gold necklaces, <laughs> jewelry all over them. They looked like they'd just gone to GQ, the big suit place. You go buy brand new suits. They were all leaving Egypt with brand new clothes on. Wow. They spoiled the Egyptians. They were wearing all this jewelry, all these necklaces, all these brand new clothes in the sight of the Egyptians. The same Egyptians who beat them or their taskmasters stood there and watched those Israelites leave with their brand new clothes on. You wouldn't be happy about it. I buy a brand new suit. I ain't going to loan it, do you? I'll wear it out, then I might let you have it, but not a brand new suit. They left with their brand new clothes on their back. Amen. And that's the clothes they wore for 40 years. So preacher, what, what man, you're talking about going out of style. Silence in society. Society that is our taskmaster tells us what to do, tells us how we're supposed to live our life, tells us how we're supposed to practice our religion. When somebody gets full of God, when somebody gets saved by the grace of God, and they start walking in that victory, nothing else beats it. Right. There's yeah. nothing, it does not go out of style watching silent, the society being silenced. Number three, quickly. And saints being sustained over those 40 years never goes out of style either. The Bible says in Numbers 9, 21, I read it to you just a moment ago, I want to read it again. The reason I want to read it again, if I can find the verses, I always get Numbers to Deuteronomy mixed up. In Numbers chapter number 9, I want to read this verse to you because I want to remind you of this promise. Numbers 9, verse 21. And it was so when the cloud <clears throat> abode from evening in the morning that the cloud was taken up in the morning and they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night, that the cloud was taken up and they journeyed. This was the daily, not Numbers, no wonder I'm in the wrong place. It's Nehemiah. <laughs> that other dude. <laughs> Forgive me. Nehemiah, I'm sorry. Verse number 21, I think. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 21. Yea, forty years did thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, the clothes waxed not old. And then here it is again, and their feet swelled not. Now I read another verse that references that, that the feet never swelled. That doesn't really seem that important, but when you consider this simple fact, you remember I said the other night that the manna falling out of heaven is a picture of Christ. That man that came every day, and he gathered in the morning, you remember I've already preached the message, I don't want to go back and belabor the point again. <clears throat> a young person like Isaac's not going to appreciate this. Miss Casey's not going to appreciate this. She's younger as well. Some here may not appreciate it. 
But most of you will. Ain't it a good day if you made it through the end of the day and you get done at night and you can't go to bed and your feet didn't swell? Amen. Yes. Amen. Ain't that a good day? Yeah. Just your feet didn't swell. I've got gout. Amen. And sometimes if I eat the wrong things, that gout kicks in and my leg will start swelling. Mm -hmm. I look like a pirate with a peg leg when you take your socks off. It's embarrassing. That's why I don't wear shorts. It's just embarrassing. And so if you, <clears throat> if you make it through the day without your feet swelling, that's a pretty good thing. They did it 40 years. And not one single day did their feet swell. Now, to a young person, that don't mean nothing. But to somebody your age, somebody older, it means something. Yeah. Your feet not swelling, that's pretty good. So, preacher, what's the, what's the point? Here's the point. If your feet swell, you can't wear the shoes. Right. Stay with me. <clears throat> if your feet swell, you can't wear the shoes. God made sure not only did the shoes not wear out, but God made sure the Jewish people that wore them, their bodies never became overwhelmed with uh, anything that would cause their feet to swell. Y'all still with me? What is the main thing a doctor tells you that you don't need to have a lot of intake in your body because if you do, going to cause you problems. If you have COPD, if you have gout like myself, or you have other issues, what's the main thing the doctor tells you? You better stay away from salt. salt. What did they eat every day for 40 years? Man. Man is a picture of Christ. Every day that manna, that breath from heaven came a picture of Christ. How did their feet not swell? Because manna has no sodium. God fed them something that would never make their feet swell. Because what good is it if you've got shoes that never go out of style, but you physically can't wear them because your feet are swelling up? When he said, I made it so your clothes didn't wear out, your shoes didn't wear out, and your feet didn't even swell. The man is a picture of Christ. God sustaining them. Listen to me carefully. I'm guaranteed to say it's one of the best. Is if, if, if this is all I ever said and I flew out here just to say this one thing, I would do it. God never does anything in your life that causes His promises not to fit. What God sustains you with what God blesses you with everyday life, how God sustains you, that picture of Christ, that manna God gives you, the promises of God to sustain you, God's provision specifically. What God provides for you every single day will never ever make your feet swell that you can't wear the promises of God every single day. Amen. What God does for me will never contradict anything else that God does for me. What good would it do me if I have shoes and never got a style, but then God feeds me something that makes my feet swell and I can't wear the promise? God never contradicts Himself. Everything He does, one thing works with the other. Always, always, always it does that. That's why you never see the Spirit of God ever contradict Scripture. That's not even possible. God will never contradict Himself. Right. So preacher, what never goes out of style? Saints being sustained. Watching God sustain His people and them letting God do it God's way. Yeah. Letting God sustain you His way never goes out of style. The moment you decide you know better, your feet's going to swell. And the promises God's got for you ain't going to fit no more. You're going to hold them in your hand, but they're not going to go on your feet. Amen. I have watched people tell me they're going to do this, and it contradicted the Word of God, and it just did not fit. And never will. Amen. Amen. My oldest grandson, Seth, I've always believed that as a parent, it helps a lot for your children to think you're a little bit off. <laughs> 
if they think, and I know you believe this, if they yeah. believe that daddy's a little bit unstable, that helps a lot. Yeah. Because yeah. they really don't know what to do with daddy. And so I'm applying that principle to my grandchildren. I want them to think Papa's a little bit off. That way when they come to Papa's house and stay, I can tell them what to do and they're going to do it because they just, they don't know. They really don't know what I'm going to do. I have a, a 2019 Nissan Titan. It has a big old V8, 5.7, I think it is V8. Praise God. I have a spiritual experience every time I punch it. Put the grandkids, it's a king cap, put the grandkids in the back, going down the road. My goal is sometime or other while they're down at the house, time they live nine hours away. We get them every now and again, I'll stay for, sometimes I'll stay for a whole week going down the road. I asked Hannah the other day, the youngest one, I said, Hannah, you like Pawpaw's truck? I knew she'd say no. The older two always, yeah, I love your truck, Pawpaw. I name a truck Graham. I said, Hannah, you like Graham? Hannah, she's about four years old, she said, no. I went, Whoop, and I took off. Now I only went up like 55, 60. It just got there really quick. The other two started crying. Papa, quit, quit. It just scares the daylights out of them. And I backed off of it and I said, listen, listen. She said something bad about Greyhound. Seth started crying. I said, Hannah, don't talk about Papa's truck. Don't talk about Papa's truck. And I goof off with my, don't get all nervous about it. I just, I'm not going to hurt them. They're my grandkids. But I want them to think Papa's a little bit off sometimes. But at the same time, there's always that one trick you do with your grandkids is you put them up on the porch and you stand there and say, come to Papa. Jump. Jump. Come on. Jump. And you watch them. You do it with all, you, all your kids. So I did it with them. When I do that, I don't, I don't joke with them because I'm trying to teach them to trust me. Right. And I stand there at the edge of the porch and say, come on, jump. Jump in Papa's arms, and you see them that they're standing there, they're thinking about it. And they'll kind of nod on to it. And then say, Come on now, I, you can trust me. And then eventually they'll finally throw all their faith in Papa, and they'll jump off the porch and hope you catch them, and you catch them. And when you do that, you instill inside of them you can trust Papa, you can trust Daddy, you can trust Mama, because they've learned to throw all their weight on you so they can trust you. It's the same way with God. It seemed like our entire Christian life, God's constantly saying, come on, jump, come on, I got you. All you got to do is trust me. I can't fail you. I'm not going to let you down. Jump, I got you. It seemed like most of our Christian life, we've battled that and tried to get through that. And you can. You can trust God. It don't go out of style. Serving Him does not go out of style. Amen. What God's done in your life, salvation never goes out of style. Victory of the world never goes out of style. God's provision never goes out of style, thank God. We have lost some great political people over recent years. One of, I think it was uh, President Reagan, his Secretary of State was George Shultz. Many of y'all remember him. George Shultz did this saying, whenever you send out an ambassador, if I understand the law correctly, when you send an ambassador out, they're normally sent out by the Secretary of State. So George Schultz, under President Reagan, every time somebody was, was sanctioned to be or commissioned to be an ambassador to a foreign country, they'd have to go meet with Secretary of State George Schultz. George Schultz would ask some questions. He would then tell them exactly what the president and the administration wanted him to know as he went to this foreign land to tell them this is what we believe, this is what we want them to do, this is what we expect from them as an ally. And so when you go, you go understanding what we're wanting. George Schultz had this habit that whenever they got done talking, he then would ask them, he'd walk over to his globe in his office, he'd spin that globe, and while it's spinning, he said, now go find the country. Go find your country. And wherever they were going, whatever country it was, with Russia, Germany, didn't matter, whatever, whatever ambassador they were, they would stop the globe and turn it to the country that they were being sent to, and they'd point at it. Because his theory was, if you don't know where it is on the map and where it is on the globe, we ain't got no business right. sending you. So finally one day, they, they commissioned Senate Majority Leader uh, Mansfield, who was very well known at that day and time, to be the new ambassador in Spain. They brought Mansfield in. Charles Schultz asked him some questions, then told him some of the things that the president wanted him to carry with him, to understand what the administration expected out of Japan. 
Schultz walked over to the globe, spun it like he did all the other times, went back to his seat, and he said, now go find your country. Mansfield walked over to the globe, stopped it, spun it back to the United States, and pointed at the United States. Schultz looked at him and said, you, you are an ambassador to Japan, not the United States. And the former Senate Majority Leader Mansfield looked at Schultz. He said, I'll be an ambassador to Japan the rest of my life, but Japan will never be my country. Amen. He said, that's my country, the United Amen. States of America. Mm. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter where we are in this life, this world is not my home. Right. Amen. I love coming out here and seeing the beauty of the state of Washington, <clears throat> one of the most beautiful states in the country. I love where I live. I love where I was born at in Carolina. But this old world's not my home. No. Thank God it's not. My home's in heaven. Hallelujah. That's my address, and that's who I represent. We're going to stand our feet all over the building.